Welcome back. Um, I have Laird Barron again. We're on the second segment or episode where we're going to talk about his writing influences, et cetera. We spent a lot of time talking about that in the last episode. Today, we're going to focus a little bit more on the general mythos that he's he's put together over time. Uh, you know, I think I think Laird, the best way to do this is let's start with kind of the old leech mythos. Like, what is it, uh, and then how does it tie into your overall universe? And if I think in 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 prior interviews you've mentioned kind of two separate overlapping universes, but let's start with old leech and then kind of wind our way into that. Sure. And I kind of want to tightrope walk it just because there's stuff that is pretty obvious either through the reading or through things that I have said publicly, but there's also a certain aura of mystery that I'd like to preserve for people that have their own views. Um, Cause I, th- I actually think that's extremely legitimate when you have something nebulous or amorphous, uh, including including like say the ending of the sopranos you've got the camp that oh you know the main character died and the other camp oh no we don't know you know just going to black doesn't mean anything i i think both no matter what chase's view of it is i still think that there's Mm -hmm. legitimate for people to to disagree so because somebody asked (laughs) me that they said the story ends and i think it means this and i'm privately thinking nope that's not what i meant oh an even bigger mystery for me in that series is what happened to the chechen he died. He's he he was just he was he was like under a stump nearby, and they just there are a couple of goobs, and they walked right past him. There you go. There's your cynicism, Laird Baron cynicism. Either that or maybe he's living in Cheshire now. He, he had a, a bag of money hidden in the woods, and he just you know, he hopped on the like an underground kind of transport system, and he's back home and telling him stories. But I think he's dead. Yeah. Okay. But sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> no, no. But the, the, so so when we talk about it, I just. I like to talk about it, but probably more in general terms, just because I don't want to be the authority on it uh, in such an authoritarian way. But I can talk about kind of how it came about. How yeah. it came about was sort of a, you know, there's a couple of ways you can go about being uh, probably any kind of a writer, right? That writes in, that writes in a tradition. And, we, and we're all writing in traditions, no matter what we do. But some are, genre, of course, really codifies certain things you know you're writing in the you're, you know the hemat tradition or you're you know um uh, hard boiled or it's or, or it's or maybe these days there's this literary kind of like procedural thing going on but i feel like when i first you know the first 10 years uh, when i kind of was making my name uh my first couple books were definitely identified whether whether i would have agreed with it or not as lovecraftian cosmic horror mm-hmm. and I never, I've never resisted labels. I think it's actually better to be typecast than not cast at all. Um, I've never had any, I won't say literary pretension. I've always, cause I've always felt like I want to write with, with, with as much integrity and much skill as I possibly can, much, as much nuance, but I've never really outside of the, uh, you know, the normal human reaction to praise or criticism, the big picture that I've always kept in my mind is that I'm a writer and you can call me whatever you want. And I just have a tendency to work in certain, I have a tendency to to till certain fields, but I I do. um, I I did feel that, you know, as an artist and somebody that had a bit of artistic ambition besides just being published in the big five magazines, uh, you know, basically established myself. I wanted people to go, that's a Laird Barron story. That would, that would have been Mm -hmm. the height of my literary ambition at the time was not that, oh, Laird's writing Lovecraftian fiction, this is a great story, but no, it's a Laird Barron story that happens to have, oh, oh, a debt to the cosmosists that have come before or the weird fiction writers that have come before. So what happened is, I, I think it was a natural progression. I initially wrote a few stories that were overtly Lovecraftian, really heavily uh, were indebted to Durleth and Lovecraft and Ar- Clark Ashton Smith and you know, some of the newer writer, Michael Shea would, would have been a big one. Some of Jack Vance's and Fritz Leiber's work. But gradually I started, you know, once I felt comfortable and once, and once I was just selling stories, once I was established, uh, once again, the privilege aspect, if you're, if, if you're privileged enough or lucky enough to establish yourself and you're pretty much selling what you write, that really frees you up in a way that 
that you might not otherwise enjoy to, to experiment because you're no longer going, Oh, I got to keep doing the same thing or they won't publish me. You're like, no, they, they're interested in my voice. It's not, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be this specific type of story. They, they want, they want a Laird Baron story. And so what ha rapidly happened is my stories became more and more Laird Baron. And out of that was born old leech. And what old leech was, was simply, well, Lovecraft and his circle have their Cthulhu and their Sothagwa and their, you know, Yog Sothoth. They have their, you know, uh, kind of their catchphrases and their, uh, their monsters and their and their own their own mythos. And so I, I didn't feel that I necessarily wanted to try to create uh, a mythos that was sui generis that it was so that was so separate from that, because I was only writing part time, and so I I still I, I felt like I want to still be identified with that. But to begin like a band, like a band that gradually starts off as one thing and they keep one hand over here, but they just start, you know, with each album, they go a little farther this other direction. And hopefully they, if they do it subtly and, and gradually enough, they will right. keep their, they will keep the majority of their audience while, while building a new audience. And that's what old Leech was. So old Leech is he's, he's, you know, could easily fit in or it could easily fit in with Cthulhu and, and the other mythos critters we're not but, right it depends on the writers or, or the readers right interpretation my, my goal wasn't to say to hell with lovecraft this is mine it was just, it was more just to say all right i'm going to do my own thing with that kind of cosmic horror and then of course as time went on i've even gone way swift to chase deals with old leech but a lot of people don't even realize that because i have so subtly kind of interwoven it with those those particular types of stories which are much more psychological thrillers and and, and horror and, and whatnot and weird fiction that it doesn't look like and is not is no longer in that fourth collection is no longer even remotely lovecraftian um not in the not not in the way that we understand lovecraft's cosmic horror i should say so right. that's that's how it began um i think that's why i did it the reason i picked the leech and this is really interesting i give credit to uh john langan uh, back in when we first hit the scene back in 2001, one of his early stories was on Skua Island. And there's yep. a scene where they are, I can't remember if they're in a cave, but they find some old Viking or quasi Viking runes inscribed on a cave wall. And there was, uh, I can't remember if it was a, an Ouroboros or if it was a, a broken ring, but hmm. he never really got into it. It was just a throwaway line. And I remember we were talking about, I think I, I want to say it was a, it was, a, it was an Ouroboros looking thing. And his, and I think he might even describe it as a worm. And it was like, it was definitely like a symbol of a God or something. And so we were right. talking about it and I said, are you going to use that? And he said, no. And I said, well, you mind if I use it? And he says, absolutely not. And so then this is about uh, when I decided to use it, it was about 2007. I wrote the story called the broadsword, which to my recollection is the first time I ever explored this creature. And I decided that Lovecraft has worms or Ramsey Campbell, you know, uh, was one of the great Lovecraftians back in the day. He had like, uh, did stories about the worm that walks and all this. And I said, okay, I want something parasitical and, and creepy and slimy. And what's more, you know, what's, what's not a worm, but is worm like. And I immediately, I flashed back to when I was a little kid and I was attacked by leeches up in Alaska. They're everywhere. Uh, I remember I climbed out of a pool one time when I was three and my mom started screaming or not a pool, uh, like a spring. And I was covered all over my body, all over with, with these cold, cold water leeches. And so I said, yeah, a leech, a leech is actually in its own way, a much more aggressive and terrifying yeah. organism than a worm. Um, they're, they're aggressive. And so, and so that's how that happens. So I give John Lang and all, all credit for it. Um, and then aspects of the, of that mythos actually, uh, were sort of created around a, a bar table um, in the uh, hotel at ReaderCon back in 2007 or eight. I was sitting there with John and Langan and Paul Tremblay. And John was telling us about when he was in Scotland or some, maybe it was France, he and his wife Fiona had found this weird pamphlet tucked away uh, on a bus. And it was this weird, like a travel guide, but it was like half scrawled and it was kind of odd. Nothing supernatural, nothing ominous, but I said, oh, and so I started talking about, uh, there's this thing that's sort of like the Necronomicon in my, uh, in my series of stories, it's called the Black Guide. 
And it's just mm-hmm. this almanac. It's like a guide. Uh, if you find it in Washington state, for example, it's a guide to like in this guy's backyard, three days out of the year in the dark of the moon, the fairies will appear, you know, or, or, or what have right. you. Somebody's basement is actually a portal to the beyond, you know, and it's, and it's, it's very mysterious. And so we talked about, we said we should all do stories with that guide and so paul's done one or two stories john did one where it was actually a website that crashes your computer and then start sending start sending messages to your fax machine months later and stuff like that and of course i did just the literal you know people in various stories of mine even going back to the logging you know like to the 1920s have found Mm -hmm. because it's never the same form twice it's a pamphlet it's a leaflet it's a tome it's a book it's a it's like a bunch of postcards stapled together or, or, or uh, thumbtack together. It's always, but it has a similar, you know, um, function, which is it's this sort of creepy alchemical occult uh, travel log. And so that's kind of how that, that's kind of how that started. And then I've just, I've expanded it over the last uh, 15 years. How does, how does old Virginia kind of at a very surfacial level? Cause that was, that wasn't the first story you published in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, but it was one of the early ones, right? The second one. Um, well, I have a couple things going on. There are at least two parallel universes uh, that I work work with, but there's but how they operate isn't isn't straightforward or traditional, and and that's for various reasons. Um, and but in both of them, there are there may be overlaps between the, the big bads, but they're not all the same. I, I, in one of my stories, I want to say it was Fear Sun, one of the characters who, who is not human, alludes to the fact there are at least three or four competing interests on earth. Old Leech being one, uh, or well, not even really Old Leech, but the adherence of Old. Old Leech is sleeping in a moon somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, he crawls, it crawls out of the moon every now and then. Uh, whichever moon that is, uh, it's it's the the cultist and these this alien alien race that that worships him that we actually interact with to our detriment. Then there's the uh, I wrote a story called which is very based on uh, Shadow out of the Shadow out of Time uh, about a beetle, a, a race of beetles that will inherit the Earth that are like super super science uh, oriented, mm-hmm. you know, far in advance of humankind. <laughs> and that would that would be another another group or another. Um, uh, faction and then the third faction that was mentioned uh there's a character called tom mandibole that has appeared in multiple stories who he, may be who may yeah. be in, in 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 a story i'm familiar with exactly and mandibole has appeared actually I w- not that many but at least four stories and in one he's a he's a puppet like literally he's a like a marionette or a hand puppet uh or in a couple of them he's that and in a couple of stories and, and a novel and a no, one of the, my novels, he's, he's a spokes, he's just a, a smarmy spokesperson for a corporation. Um, and another story that you may be familiar with, he, uh, he's something quite spectacularly strange, but the idea is that he, he's appeared in a few. So I guess maybe he has appeared a few more stories than I even realized, but he's always, he, he has different, he, it's always the same thing, but he does have different manifestations. And I, I would say for Lovecraft uh, fanatics, he he's a lot like the avatar of Nyar Lathotep. The you know the blues player would be one of the you know he has different. Sometimes it's a sphinx-like monster, and sometimes it's a blues player type of thing. And if he represents the third faction, which in in at least one story was alluded to be essentially like a um, Azathothian, you know, this monstrous, um, maybe not, maybe even an idiot god that exists just beyond our reality like in another plane it's kind of frozen there but there's like a little pinhole and uh mandibole is sort of like almost his little jesus avatar he's you know he's here doing doing his bidding because the rest of it can't come through so those are yeah those those are uh are, are three elements and of course in the the story that you mentioned old virginia there's uh an antagonist that allegedly exist under at least one or two mountain ranges but maybe the whole continent of the united states which is uh the father mother which in biblical times was referred to as belphegor balpior it's this sort of amorphous creature that sends forth 
agents to do its bidding. Now, now this is this is a commercial question, but if someone wanted to get up to speed on these kind of overlapping, uh, you know, uh, 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 this overlapping mythos and the, the different kind of well, actually, this is not mythos, but the competing factions in this broader mythos. Which book should they go to first and check out? Well, <laughs> of my books, uh, Occultation, yep. which is the second of the three, and The Beautiful Thing, probably at this point, um, had the most direct references. I mean, stuff appears in the first book, but there's really no explanation. But, but right, if you, if you read all three of the first, uh, of the, of, uh, if you read my first three collections, you, you would be ca- pretty much caught up. But there's, a, there's another way to do it, too, and maybe do it simultaneously, is there are a couple of people who have put together uh sort of this concordance of my work one's eve Trigny and yep. uh, they who dwell in the cracks it's which is kind of it hasn't done anything with it recently but it basically goes through my fiction and and, and shows how it connects and he any sort of you know writes a thesis here and there on what's going on so that's that's something you could you could look at might help and more recently i read a reddit user named slow to chase um in opposition to swift to chase he's put together this thing called the the laird baron mapping project which is really cool it's uh it's 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 less academic and more and more like um the wikis that you get like if you're interested in game of thrones or supergirl or something like that you'll go on the wiki and it'll it'll go down through the characters and tell you who the characters are and then draw connections to other characters and are they alive are they dead what stories do they appear in uh, so the, the laird baron mapping project which is ongoing uh, would be a really great p- place to, if you're reading stuff and you want to know more about it, uh, this, this person has really, has, is delving into that. Now let's, let's talk a little bit about Rex. Hmm. Tell us, tell us about Rex and, <laughs> and which stories he's in and why he's, why he's important in your mythos. Yeah. Um, Rex and actually, I wouldn't even be able to tell you all the stories. Rex has been in, in at least four stories, uh, including The Big Whimper, which people get to read here, and uh, the World War, weird World War Four anthology very soon. Um, well, he's important to me because dogs and, and, and our mankind's relationship, humankind's relationship with dogs uh, is of particular interest to me, and I think of particular importance. And... <clears throat> Uh, you know, also just the challenge of following in the footsteps of somebody like Jack London, you know, uh, the call of the wild Mm -hmm. where you follow the, or white bang, right. Where those are your, your central characters. I, you know, I always wanted to, because those are authors. I love, you know, that's an author. I love those are stories. I love Um, obviously uh, watership down. Of course, that's more, you know, the rabbits are more anthropomorphic, but I wanted to write a story where, um, that kind of follows in that tradition. So I could see if I could do it, but also just because I wanted to do it. I wanted to create a character like that. And uh, I have a tendency to write, to, to dream. And usually the dreams are pretty horrific. I have a lot of nightmares, but the upside is I get a lot of material from my dreams for, for stories. And I dreamed of Rex quite a few times. And, and so I started putting together, okay, well, who is Rex? What is Rex? And I realized that, of course, the way that my universes work and the way that kind of the background of Rex is that he can exist in almost any uh, era, almost any type of story that, that I'm writing. And, and part of that is because the final incarnation of Rex, or at least the, you know, where, where he's around, you know, 2 million or 3 million years from now as a cybernetic quantumly empowered, like a doomsday machine with fur, mm-hmm. you know, he's, he's, I wouldn't even say he's cybernetic. He's something, you know, he's a quantum, he's quantum machinery. Some iterations of Rex that I've written about, he's literally a clanking robot with a, with, with a dog brain or a, or a dog consciousness, but he's like literally an Android. Other stories, he's a dog with just some micro circuitry. The one uh, that I wrote for you, he's pretty much close to his ultimate form, which is, you're not really sure what he is because mm-hmm. um, a lot of him exists in a quantum state. You know, he's like a 200 pound dog until he's ready to destroy the world. And then all of a sudden he's the size of a battleship and he has nuclear armament. And th- where was that? Well, that was in a quantum 
he can literally manifest it from a quantum state because he is so he comes from a, a world far in our future plus there's other elements that don't even come up in that story there's multiple universes there's multiple uh iterations of rex so so it, it was just something that i could just play with that endlessly and these days, uh, I'm writing uh, a bunch of science fiction, or excuse me, they're kind of dark fantasy stories with science fictional elements, and multiple versions of Rex exist within there. And one of them, he's a, because it's a fantasy setting, like a very high fantasy setting, he's, he's, he's referred to as the clockwork dog, mm. because he's, he doesn't, he doesn't, it doesn't manifest like the iron giant, you know, like, like a tank with, with fangs and ears and fur, he manifests as with clockwork machinery uh that's how the technology manifests but he's you know breathes fire like a dragon and howls can skin you with his howl and or or, or shatter a mountainside or whatever so uh the other cool thing about it, the reason that i can use him in almost any any era that i choose is because ray because rex because of his unique physiology and his unique psychology with his bifurcated personality he literally has um <coughs> genetic memory so he actually can retrieve memories from the first dogs he, theoretically he could go back to when the first dog a wolf crawled into the first cave and he would have he would have that imagery somewhere buried in him that he could draw upon which also has a tendency to lend to his instability uh, his mental instability <laughs> So, you know, for, for folks listening, Laird's story, uh, Big Whimper, is in Weird World War Four, And, uh, you know, I was blown away by it, by the way. Like, I, I read that story and I was just like, I was just amazed by you. You have a way of describing things, you know, such that they just the images appear in your head. And I, and I really can't put my finger on exactly what you do, but. It's a, uh, you know, Stephen King would say it's a sort of like writing is telepathy. Like you're, you're really skilled at doing that. Are there <coughs> conscious techniques that you employ or is it something that. Oh, first of all, thanks. Appreciate it. Um, I, like I said, it's the ecstasy of influence. I don't, my, my only limits on my writing, like my, my process and my aesthetic is I don't want to restate simply restate what better writers have done. I, I want to, I, 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 when I write, like say a rec story, I love it if, oh, it reminds me of Zelazny, but it's not Zelazny. Uh, and that's what I aim for. And I'm, I'm gonna give him credit. Zelazny is probably the most important author pound for pound in my, in my life to me uh, because of the effect he had on me. I'm not pr proclaiming him as the, the best author by any means, simply that he, I'm not even sure he's my favorite author on a day-to-day -day basis. That, so it's very difficult for me to ever be narrowed down that way. But I do believe that I have reacted to Zelazny to such a degree that it's had a very positive effect on my own writing. I learned a lot of tricks from him. And one of the, one of the things I learned from Zelazny is when I was very young, I read the Nine Princes in Amber uh, series. And there was this one section in the first book um, where, where Corwin is heading for Amber and he's got an army and he's going to invade and, and he is traveling through shadow and he keeps, keeps going through these different landscapes, different places. And I thought it was so richly detailed, so evocative. And it had been a few years since obviously I read it when I was very young and I, I thought, man, that was must be a thick book. That was a huge section. So I go back and read it. No, it was like four pages. And yet in those four pages, he chronicled like this army that's basically a million strong. We lost a hundred thousand in this jungle where at night the flowers opened up and emitted an aroma and men would wander off. And then we traveled through a cold desert and I lost 250,000 men there. And then we traveled through some other place. It was like this, you, he goes, we had the big hairy guys and the little red guys. And we traveled through this place that looked like the heaven of the big red guy or the big, or the big blue guys. And we lost 300,000. And that was that. That was all wow. it was. That was all it was. Yeah. Yeah. There was. There was. There was more. But that's literally. I'm kind of paraphrasing what he did. I remembered it as because I've I've read a lot of um, Lord Dunsany and I've read uh, um, 
you know, like Dickens and Edgar Rice Burroughs and Robert E. Howard, where they really do spend a lot more time describing things. Um, and, and, and it's fine. That's another, that's just simply another style. But I, I read a lot of the old, Edgar Allan Poe spends quite a bit of time over detail. And mm -hmm. I thought, so I'm trained to be like, okay, I'm reading this, or these writers have trained me to read them a certain way. So I was really used to reading the dense Baroque classics where everything's circular, where they take a page to get to the point that a modern author, a contemporary author is like a sentence. And I didn't, re but see, Zelazny bridged the gap. It wasn't Spartan, it was simply sufficient. And it created this, it was a magical way of creating this, this imagery and making you responsible for the reader responsible. And so I, I was, I, later on, I read a, um, a few comments that he made about how he does it. And he was of the school that you don't over describe characters. He said, people don't, he goes, they don't remember, he goes, so, he would pick two or three details of an important character and that's all he was a large man with a black cloak and a long stride that's all you get that's all you need and he says if he continually reappears if the character is important enough later on he'll pluck at his scar or later on you know uh you know you'll see these missing a finger on his left hand when he takes his gauntlet off but very brief and and and, and doled out uh it, it measured you know measured doses and so i don't think that i write like him particularly but i've certainly mm -hmm. taken his and, and sometimes i go at, as he did he he actually has uh if you look at lord of light for example or my name is legion which is a group of stories he occasionally will just go all in on a three-page description of a sunset and a rainstorm that comes in he, he he was capable of doing that of just lush over purple almost purple over description but then he'd rein it in and go he was a large man with dark hair and a black cape and he could do so what i what i got from that is close up versus a wide yeah. tracking shot or a, or an overhead like so he could do smash close up or a detail close up or he could just give you the overview where you're you're a drone flying over the countryside and it just he was that smooth and so i'll never be as smooth as elasney but i can certainly try on that note, what sorts of things are you working on? Well, actually, step back. What is some of the latest work that has come out recently that people can check out? And then what are some of the projects that you're currently working at, working on that will come out, you know, a year down the line or so? The, the most recent books I've had come out, uh, the trilogy of novels uh, about Isaiah Coleridge, Blood Standard, Black Mountain, and Worse Angels came out in 2020. So those are, those are, <coughs> pardon me, those are pretty fresh. And I'm also, uh, just to skip ahead, I'm actually writing more stories about those characters, uh, short fiction stories. But um, in short, you know, uh, stuff that's coming out now or will be coming out really soon, quite a bit of short fiction. Uh, obviously, The Big Whimper's coming out here in a week or two. I also have uh, a story that I'm re really proud of coming out uh, in a Ellen Datlow anthology, uh, Screams from the Dark. Probably one of the, I think it's one of the creepier stories that I've been able to engineer, came out just a few months ago, uh, oh, back yeah, in yeah. September. It's called Tip Shirley Jackson one. Yeah, yeah, when things get dark. And let me, I'm really proud to be in that anthology because much like the one that's coming out from Tor, that one came out from, I believe, Titan. Uh, it's a who's who of contemporary just master level writers i mean joyce carol oates kelly lank elizabeth han john lang is in it it's a who's who as is the is the upcoming so I, I have stories in those i have quite a few stories coming out in smaller anthologies and my agent's on leave right now but probably the next month or so when she gets back i'm going to hand her the manuscript for the for my next uh, contemporary horror collection and see what she thinks of that. So I'm very close to handing that in. And then it's just a matter of time of, you know, figuring out who would like to, you know, if anybody wants to publish it. Uh, and then the other two things that I'm working on, I'm really high on these. I'm working on a, a novel that's set kind of in this alter alternate uh, fantasy setting. It's called Antiquity. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with it if they read The Croning. It's the first chapter of The Croning. It's sort of set in this fairy tale realm that's unlike ours. And so mm -hmm. I've been writing a lot of stories based on that realm. It's a realm of, uh, you know, it's like a Carl Edward Wagner by Louis L'Amour, Zane Gray, um, Jack Vance, 
Fritz Leiber, that, you know, Gene Wolfe, that this weird uh, high fantasy yet low science fiction background kind of a setting. Just, it's very, it's very strange, very bizarre. Um, and it features a lot of characters from, from my other stories. They kind of like Stephen King's territories where you run into the doubles or doppelgangers of, mm-hmm. you know, North American characters he's written about. They're in the territories. I've, I've got kind of that thing going on. So there's a novel. I, I'm quite a ways <laughs> into writing a novel about that. But I've also well over halfway through a collection of those stories. And so I, it would be like my, I guess, my Carl Edward Wagner, Jack Vance, Louis L'Amour uh, phase that I'm, that I'm working on there. All right. One last question for you for this episode. What advice would you give to uh, writers who, and not just <laughs> not just new writers, but writers who've been at it for a while in terms of trying to get better, trying to get into the top magazines, things like that. Man, I give advice against my better judgment because advice is so personal. Um, So I I would actually preface it just by saying, when you're looking to get advice, throw your net as widely as possible because a lot of times advice that works for you just boils down to hearing the right the right thing because because what works for me may not work for you um but if you talk to enough people or listen to enough people that are doing the same things you are you're going to find something that works for you it's like what they used to say about martial arts when you're attacked in the street what's the best martial art to defend yourself and any wise sensei will say which one do you know which one suited you know right that's the thing and so a lot of a lot of this about advice has less to do with there's some magic bullet or a silver bullet and more finding what tool fits your hand the best and then focusing on it. Um, I would also say don't take advice literally, even if someone spews it literally. Uh, example, write every day. Well, a lot of people push back on that and complain about that. And I think some of it's legitimate and some of it's whining. But here's the thing. I, I never took that advice when I heard it as write every day. I took it as, well, if you want to get better at something, practice, practice it as often as you can. Right. Maybe, maybe you can practice it four hours a day or eight hours a day because you're in jail and you've got nothing else to do. Maybe you've got three kids and four jobs and you can only do it 10 minutes in the evening. Joe Lansdale talks about this. He says, you know, there's not some people get bogged down with thinking you do something all the time. That means that it's not worthwhile unless you attach a certain, like you can't attach value to it unless you, you, you cross some threshold. That's a real, I don't want to say uniquely American idea, but it's certainly an American idea. The fatter the book, the better. The more time I do something, the better. Right. Which is obviously is bullshit, right? It could, it could be true, but it's, it's bullshit in a blanket sense. So I would say don't always take advice like more um, in an abstract sense. So like, I will say, yeah, the more you write, the, the better off you are. If that means you can only write a minute a day or a minute every other day or five minutes at the end of the week, do it. But, but I will say this, this is something for people to keep in mind. In any other profession, like say you want to be a skier, nobody says, well, just ski when you want to, you'll be great. They're like, well, what do you want to do with, what, what's your goal? To, just to ski or, to, or do you want to be on the Olympic team or what, what is the deal? And they're like, well, I want to ski professionally. They're going to tell you, get some skis, get the best you can, find some hills and uh, practice, practice, practice as much as you can. So that, that's all I would say is that, that art may be slightly different. Uh, you, can practice, you can practice art when you're not sitting at the, like, at the keyboard. I think I do my best writing when I'm watching something and going, that's not how I would do it. <laughs> but uh, I, I would say as, as much time as you can devote without alienating your family, uh, or, or getting fired, you really, you know, you, you will be rewarded. Um, and the other thing I would say, and that's for, for newer writers, for, for writers that have been around a while, I think uh, all I would say is something that I, it occurred to me is that it's your, it's your career or your, uh, if you're not worried about your career, it's your time. It's your body of work that you're creating. You have, uh, every say in what, ha- you know, in, in what you write about. I think we get caught up in, well, I can't sell to these four magazines that always buy for me because if, if I try something different. Well, I, I think you need to give your, I think you need to give yourself permission 
if you if you want to like in other words if you're not always happy with what you're doing to do other things because mm-hmm. i have found that failing in other genres or being less successful has only made me stronger in the things that i was already uh skilled at all right thank you for that advice and with that we're gonna end the episode we're gonna continue with laird on a uh, on the next topic which we'll reveal in the next episode thank you laird talk to you soon thank you